guess we can call the meeting to order and we open the floor to public comment for anybody who has anything on their mind just from the first question but today's for first no paper handling yes okay uh <laughs> i was trying to make sorry say that <laughs> Okay, so we have the minutes of the January 15 meeting. We need to take action on this. Anybody want to make a motion? Make a motion to approve the minutes of January 15th. I'll second that motion. Me, uh, okay, motion is second. In all in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. All right, our topic for today is the geo enable elections. We've got Justin and Mark and that main year, so looks like you're all ready for us. Yep, yeah, I'm ready. Well, Hi, I'm, I'm Justin Smith. I'm the fire engineer. Um, manager of GIS, and today with me uh, Patrick and Sarah from there. They're other members of our GIS department. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, geo-enabled elections, uh, focusing mainly on uh, the county, but also sort of wh where the state uh, has a responsibility. And uh, this presentation, I, I think I made it for. I tried to make it for. Uh, the, People who are very familiar with elections and people who are very familiar with GIS. So it's going to have, uh, uh, since you're very familiar with uh, elections, I think that I'll be showing a little bit more about GIS that you may not be familiar with. So today I'll talk about uh, how we use GIS to increase the accuracy of the elections of the county. So we'll look at how we create precincts, uh, how we take registered voters from the, from the shore system and get them into GIS. Talk about redistricting, uh, primarily uh, precinct level re redistricting. But if you want to talk about gerrymandering, you know, feel good. I, you know, I know quite a bit about that too. Um, we'll talk about looking at uh, how, to, how we assign, how we get to assign polling places, and uh, we'll look at the, the voter uh, locator web application that uh, our elections department uses. So precinct polygons. We have. 120 voting precincts in the county, and they are subdivisions of municipalities. So here you can see this is this is Penn Township. That's just Penn Township is one voting precinct, and here we have West Pennsboro. West Pennsboro is split into two voting precincts. So court order precinct descriptions are the authoritative source of our precinct boundaries. So here I have a precinct description. These are both precinct descriptions from South Milton. This precinct description existed before 2010, and this precinct description was after 2010 when uh, South Milton redistricted from four precincts to nine. Uh, and we worked with, uh, I worked with Elections, the Board of Elections, and Solicitor uh, to write out some very descriptive precinct descriptions. Uh, so this, the example here in red is just an example of, of what uh, the precinct descriptions could look like, sort of a worst case scenario. So if you read the first line here, the northern boundary of this precinct is formed by a <coughs> private, private, private roadway. Not very descriptive there. Um, the northern boundary formed by a private roadway. Who knows what that private roadway could be? Um, whereas here, in a more descriptive uh, uh, description, uh, we, we have a uh, beginning at the intersection of the Lurgan Grange Railroad, Dixon Township is boundary 500 feet south of Pine Road, and then continuing on, we go easterly, northerly, westerly, along different um, distinct physical boundaries. So, working off the knowledge that all municipal all municipality, all precinct boundaries exist within municipal boundaries, we know that all municipality boundaries are also precinct boundaries. So we start forming our precinct polygons by by working with this pie layer. So here's a municipality boundary line. Here's a municipality boundary line. Here's a municipality boundary line. So we take a municipality boundary and then we start cutting it up based on descriptions. So here's that railroad that Lurgan Branch Railroad um, that's 500 feet south of Pine Road right there. So start cutting out these polygons based on those official descriptions. 
So we're following, uh, we're following municipality boundary lines, we're following railroads, we're following roads, um, streams, um, so that we're creating a precinct boundary layer based on other authoritative data sources so that they're all aligned, they're all built within uh, working off of each other. A question on that? Sure. Um, you know, what happens in a case like we had a few years ago, uh, I think, I can't remember if it was Dickinson, South Middleton, yes. where there's a disputed boundary line, right. and we actually find out, that, and it ends up having to change. Right. Does that impact, how does that impact you? Well, uh, in a case like Dickinson, South Middleton, uh, Dixon South Milton went through the Boundary Commission, uh, got a court-ordered court order new boundary with uh, five new monuments along the boundary. And Dixon South Milton is now the best boundary in the county because it is it has been surveyed <coughs> with 2010 technology and the precision of monumentation is excellent. So, um, unfortunately, we had to go through a protracted, expensive process to, to get that great boundary. But now that we have that, we can map that in and we make sure everything aligns to it, and that's really easy. So does that have the potential of changing your precinct boundaries with something like that? Yeah, we, if, we get, if we get a court or uh, boundary uh, decision, uh, that changes boundaries. Now, a lot of our boundaries between municipalities date back to 1820. Well, um, so it's been said by more than a few people that we better not look too close at some of the other boundaries. Yeah, um, I can have quite. A, I mean, I could talk for hours about precinct or this this county boundaries. Um, there's uh, so if you look back. There, I mean, there's some scary stuff back there where it talks about. I mean, if you look at between Middlesex and North Middleton, it goes from a fence post seven miles north to a tree on the mountain. So if we can challenge 1850. We can challenge the future. Is there anything we can do? Could be different. Though? So right now, the the uh, Pennsylvania Geo Board is uh, the, the geo board right now is actually up for reauthorization through the, in the state legislature. But the, the PA geo board is looking into a very long-term process of aligning municipality boundaries throughout the state. And that, they're looking at like 30 years, a 30 year process. Of, but they the first, it's an issue. The first step is aligning PennDOT boundaries with census boundaries. That's the first step they're working on. But yes, it's a recognized issue I mean, you look right here, I have a gap between, <laughs> I have a gap here between a municipality boundary and a precinct boundary. I mean, nobody lives here, but this is a, uh, this is, this is a PennDOT boundary, and this is the boundary that I created before we used PennDOT boundaries as the authoritative source. Uh, so there are issues, and, and I'll, I, we will point out some very specific <coughs> um, concerns and uh, real life situations where this impacts you know, how, how we go about placing registered voters because the boundary lines are the worst lines. The best lines that we have for precincts are the boundaries between the precincts themselves. But once it gets to the municipality boundaries, there are inherently lots of problems from the problems that we have from municipality boundaries. And we'll talk about that later. So the registered voter database, um, whenever you see a slide with sort of this parchment background, this is where I'm citing statutes, I'm citing Pennsylvania State Code. So it's in the uh, Pennsylvania statutes that um, there is to be a shore system. And uh, Bethany and her, her department uses the shore system. Uh, it's a statewide uniform registry of electors. It's a database that they have access to for maintaining uh, a record of all registered voters and where those registered voters are to be placed into what precincts into what uh, election districts. <laughs> so this is a screenshot of what the shore system looks like and I'll walk through every column here. So here we have, uh, this is a street, uh, a street range. So this is not, uh, this is not uh, image capture of, of what a registered voter's information would look like. This is an image capture of what a street range would look like where, they, where you would place a registered voter into a precinct. Um, so here we have uh, Harrisburg, Harrisburg Pike. And here we have OEB, that stands for odd, even, both. So here we have uh, 
an even side of the street, odd side of the street, even side, odd street, odd side, and uh, both sides of the street. An address range from 817 to uh, 1048. An address range of 1050 to 1398, even, right? Um, street name, street suffix, uh, or thoroughfare type, uh, what, what zip code you're in, what uh, zip code, and these are both zip codes, you know, with the number and the city name, and then we have the precinct here. So this 19, uh, that would be well, North Milton. <laughs> and uh, 13, uh, 1301 and 1302, that's split between those things. Yeah. All right. Um, so those codes mean something to, to Bethany. Uh, and I have uh, corresponding codes in, you know, in, in this data. Uh, so 2602, that's a, a code that corresponds to this shore database. So uh, this is how they sort registered voters into precincts in the shore system. This system is very similar to our master street and address guide that we maintain for 911. Uh, the master street and address guide is slowly going away. We're going, moving towards the next gen 911 where, where we have a true GIS system. But uh, in the meantime, you know, we have a master street and address guide here that looks very similar to what the, the shore system is. We have uh, odd, even, both sides of the street. Uh, a low range, a high range, street name, what municipality that this uh, street and address range are assigned to. So the shore system and the other side really have the same capabilities. They have street names and address ranges. It's county maintained data. Um, the shore system is actually a state system, but the county maintains the data within that system. And these are tabular ranges, not spatially enabled. Right? So this is just uh, a simple, efficient way of maintaining where people are supposed to be based on an address range and a, a road view. So the next step is synchronizing that data with GIS. So here I have, in yellow, I have a segment of the Harrisburg Pike Select, and this is what a road range, a road segment in GIS looks like. From intersection to intersection, uh, we have Harrisburg Pike, uh, a low range and a high range. Uh, with um, the left side of the street being even, the, odd side of the, or the, the right side of the street being odd. And this is how we spatially place people. Or this is how, how we spatially go from a tabular uh, database to a tabular database that's attached to a spatial feature. And like I said before, we're using this this road segment, this, this Harrisburg Pike Road, to snap, we're basically snapping this polygon, this pink polygon to this line. We're snapping the blue polygon to this line. So we're using authoritative sources like this road sound line to create the precinct boundary so that we know if we place somebody here on the side of the street or on this side of the street, we know that it's, it's properly mapping into Bill 62 or Bill 61. So now we take the registered voter database, and this is just a snapshot. Um, I've changed all the information in here, so this is not representing anybody. Um, but here we have, you know, voter informa ID information, their name. Uh, we have R's and D's here, house number, uh, street, city. This is really what we care about. When we go in here, uh, when we when we <coughs> synchronize or check uh, election. Uh, data or registered voter data. What we do is we come in here and we take this ID number so that we can talk to our election department about you know, what, who, who we're talking about here, and then we'll delete these three fields. Right? We don't care about your name. We don't care about your 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 party. And we take the house, the street, the city, you know, your location information, and then we check that. So what we'll do is we'll geocode. We'll take. Uh, We'll take every single one, we can take you know, all 150,000 records and place them on, on address points, place them on the road segments, and here we have 1310 Bowling Springs Road right here. We know 1310 um, is on this side of the street. Oh, this might be Church Street, I'm not sure. Let's go over here. Uh, 1281, so 1281 Bowling Springs Road and 1278. So here we have the, the odd side of the street, here we have the even side of the street. Even side of the street being in Monroe 1, outside of the street being in Monroe 2. And when we place those, what we do 
is we check to make sure that the 1278 Bowling Springs Road is in Monroe 1, and then we'll check that against this, right? So then we know that spatially, um, that address is in the same precinct that the shore system has tab in the tabular data. So we're synchronizing those two data sets. So this is where we run into problems. Uh, along this pattern boundaries. So here we have four precincts, one, two, three, four precincts, in two municipalities, one, two. And here I've selected where the shore district, um, the, the precinct district in shore is not equal to the shore <coughs> the precinct district of GIS elements. And we've gone through and we've done a couple of these synchronizations where we go through and we really clean up the data. And, and we're, we, have, we have very few errors now when, when we begin this process. And really, as an example, most of the errors we have are along those municipality boundaries. Um, so the municipality boundaries, um, you know, we, we already had a conversation. The municipality boundaries are, are an issue. But we know that, and um, whenever you guys have a new Whenever elections has a new address that they're not certain of, you know, they'll look it up. And if they see that that, that new address is very close to a municipality boundary, they take a step back. Because <laughs> I've told them, be careful about the municipality boundaries. They'll take a step back and they'll contact us to make sure they're placing that, uh, that new uh, registered voter in the correct municipality. Okay, so we'll get into precinct redistricting. And the Pennsylvania Election Code. Uh, defines that the county court of common pleas may create new precincts. They must divide boroughs and townships. Um, so there can't be precincts that cross boroughs and township lines. And they have to be in compact and contiguous precincts. The boundaries must be formed by clearly visible phys physical features, uh, conforming with census block lines. So the clearly visible physical features to us are roads, streams, um, railroads. And n new pre precincts should not contain more than 1,200 registered voters. <laughs> that can be tricky um, because um, a lot of uh, municipalities don't want the bare minimum of precincts. You know, it's hard, it's hard to get staffers <coughs> and staff to, to staff all these precincts. So you don't want to create too many precincts. So getting to that 1,200 registered voter um, is tricky when you're creating new precincts. So this is where uh, GIS analysis comes in. Uh, we, we look at the polygon of the municipality. We take that as the as the basic sh outline shape. We start looking at uh, the registered voters as they're geocoded. We look at census blocks, and then it gets complicated. So first thing we do is we geocode the registered voters. So these are all the registered voters in Silver Spring. And then the purple lines represent the census blocks. We bring those in there. Now, what we do is we take all these registered voters, all these points, and we join them to the census block. So we have a count. We have a count of every one of these points that's in this shape, 229. Right? So we take all of these. Now that we know how many registered voters are in each of these census blocks, now we start playing with the shape. We start adding them together in different ways to get closer to this 1,200. Right, so we take all of these census blocks right here, we add them together, we get 1182. So we start uh, playing with these different shapes here. And uh, we, we want to work with the county election department, uh, board of elector, uh, uh, board, uh, board of elections, um, and uh, the municipalities, because the municipalities know their municipality better than we do, right? So we work with those uh, local officials to get feedback on what, you know, what's the best way you want this shaped out? You know, how do you want to see this? Um, here, this is one that can't work because here we have well over 1,200 registered voters in these. Um, so I think this is the this is the one we ended up with um, for Silver Spring when we redistricted re re the precincts. 
So when we look at uh, precinct redistricting, we look at compactness, right? Because compactness was part of that. Uh, dividing a borough into, or township into compact and contiguous precincts, that's in the code itself. So how do we measure that? Well, I use a, uh, there's a couple different measurements you can use for compactness. I, <coughs> I like to use the Pulse Be Power measurement. It's um, four times pi times area divided by perimeter squared. And the easy, the easy way to think about that is that a circle is 100% compact. You can't get any more compact than a circle. And when you start deviating from that, you start getting less and less compact. So a circle could be 100% compact. A square would be 78%. This shape is 58%. This shape is 24% compact, and this shape is 7% compact. So we look at the compactness scores of the precincts that we developed for Silver Spring, and this is what we get. We get around a, an average 52% compactness. I would say anything that's uh, around uh, or above or around 40% is, is a good score. Because remember, you have to follow uh, those physical features. You have to make logical, recognizable boundaries, right? So the common wood, that makes a good boundary. It's not a very straight or nice line um, for a compactness score because of, its, because of how uh, irregular it is, but it's a, good, um, it's a good physical boundary to use for a, a, a precinct because you know, it, it's, it's very easy to know, you know, north or south of the common way. It's a very clear, clearly recognizable boundary. Does the connectivity between, like when it splits by a creek or something, does yeah. that, does, do you factor in at all whether there's like a bridge connecting the two sides or there's no bridge connecting the two sides? Right, so um, in this case, um, for this precinct, uh, there is a road that goes back there. It's like a, uh, what's this called? I forget the name of the road. There is, there's a name, there's a road that comes off of the Conway Pike and goes back here into the development. Um, in this case, uh, there is no uh, connecting road that goes directly through, you know, this, uh, this small section over here. There's no, uh, you actually have to go out of the precinct to get into the, uh, the other part of the precinct. Um, so that does happen. Uh, we, we try to avoid that, but sometimes uh, in order to maintain in order to maintain the fewest number of like, precincts, I mean, that's what we really want here. We don't want, uh, what we want to do is we want to take the total number of registered voters in uh, Silver Spring, divide that by 1,200, and that's as we want to get as close to that number as possible. Uh, like, I think this is nine uh, precincts. You know, we could go to 11 precincts or 12 and make it, um, precincts make a lot of sense and make them very compact, and, uh, but then we, We'd be unnecessarily going beyond uh, the mandate, and then we have to staff. The reason I ask more. this is probably self evident. If you have uh, two sections that are split and not accessible, easily accessible to each other, they're still both expected to vote in the same right. precinct. Yeah. Uh, voting and we'll get to that. Sometimes when we start talking about polling places, uh, a, lot of, a lot of this area around, <laughs> around Gansburg. <coughs> You don't really get many good polling places. I mean, the, the, the pikes up here, Carlisle pikes up here, and the Kansas over here. This is nothing but subdivisions. So if, if that's that makes it even harder to get a, a polling place actually within that precinct. We talk about that as well. Sometimes, sometimes you have to get a, a polling place that's outside of the precinct itself. I just wondered if the, if that is one of the criteria we set at least to try I, to. I, I keep it. It's in the in the. In the election code, um, it needs to be contiguous, but there's no nothing in the election code about you having to have uh, direct road access right. from one part of the precinct to another part of the precinct. So somebody may have to drive it pretty far out of the way in the polling precinct. It, it can, you know, redistricting sometimes does inconvenience some people compared to where they were able to vote for before. Um, you know, I, I, I understand there's a limited amount of anything we can do about it. I'm yeah. just curious if we do make the effort to 
Well, and also the townships and boroughs have to yep. approve this <coughs> split. Right. So we come up with the ideas, and then I think we gave Silver Spring yeah. like three or four yeah. options. We gave, and then I they mean, pay. these are basically, so. these are just three of the options we gave Silver Spring. Yeah. So they're a part of it, is, you know, too, as far as what they think would be best for their voters. And Okay, uh, this slide's a little bit different. I thought of a better way to present it. So, we're going to talk a little bit about legislative redistricting. We were talking about precinct redistricting, now we're going to get into legislative redistricting. So, uh, the, the, the state has a, I'm trying to list some responsibilities of the state. They have a reapportionment commission that redraws legislative districts after a regular sem seminal uh, census. And then the Supreme Court reviews and approves that. Our responsibility is to reassign those voters into these new legislative districts. And then ensure, and that helps ensure that every voter is getting the right ballot. If we're, if, we're putting, if we're putting the registered voters into the correct legislative districts, that helps us ensure that voters are getting the right ballot for where they, where they live. So the, the redistricting process has its own website. Um, they provide some good information to us GIS folks through these. They have uh, shape files that, that, that we can import and works for creating our system. That's a good resource so that we don't actually have to create the legislative boundaries themselves from descriptions. So, uh, you know, real quickly, the 203 PA House representatives, which you guys are familiar with these maps, um, state senator, and then Congressional 18 uh, U.S. House representatives, and in this example, I really try to zoom in to where it gets weird, right? So um, here's North Middleton three in uh, North Middleton precinct three is in Congressional District 13, and here is North Middleton three that's in a different congressional district. So North Middleton three was a precinct they got split between two congressional districts. So we went into uh, the description. Uh, the description actually cites you know, which census blocks are in which congressional district. Um, and we drew a line based on that description. Um, we checked it against the information provided by uh, the redistricting websites. And uh, this is how, and, and we, assign, we, we maintain two different polygons just for North Middleton three. Even though it's one precinct, we maintain two different polygons because it's split by congressional. And there's this little piece of North Middleton one that's split off into congressional district 13, even though most of North Middleton one's in congressional 10. Seven voters. <coughs> right, 13th congressional, North Middleton one. You said seven. Seven. Oh, gosh. Yeah, right here. <laughs> Uh, so, what do you do to make sure they get the, the ballot they... The precinct, it's still one precinct, but it's set up separate once they walk inside. And that's especially evident in North Middleton 3. North Middleton 1 is so small, the, the seven voters, you know, it's just the seven. North Middleton 3 is split almost in half between the 13th and the 10th. So, our judge of elections there is amazing. And we have colored arrows, and everything that's North Middleton 3, Congressional District 13 is orange, and everything <coughs> Congressional District 10 is you know, blue or whatever, and they, they have arrows so they get to one counter, figure out which district they're in, and go to those separate poll books. Everything's color-coded, machines, separate machines, everything. And he just runs everything completely separate. So it's like two polling places in one. Yeah. The other one's so tiny that it really doesn't have this much impact. And then I just wanted to mention that there is a, uh, the governor did uh, have a, a commission publish six months ago a, a reform report of the redistricting process. So that is out there. Uh, so we also look at potential polling places. So the election code also <laughs> defines how we should be selecting polling places. So we have options at schoolhouses, municipal buildings, or other public buildings. Uh, and then in the event that no public buildings are available in that electric dis election district, 
uh, we may designate a public building in another election district immediately adjacent to that boundary. So that was the example that I was giving where in uh, precinct is just subdivisions and residential housing. There's no good option for a schoolhouse or a public building. So we go outside of that precinct to an adjacent uh, precinct. So here I'm zooming into uh, Mechanicsburg. And what we've done is we've, we've created a list of potential polling places, polling place options. Of, uh, so here we have the borough, Mechanicsburg Borough Office. Here we have a fire company. Here we have a church. And we have five dozen, uh, I'm sorry, here's an elementary school. And we have five dozen churches. Um, and we just have, and, and we can take this spatial data, export a table, um, uh, church, fire company, elementary school. And this is our address, and this is what precinct we're in. And we provide that to um, elections for their sort of solicitation search for a new precinct, our polling place. And you guys, I hear all the times like, we need, a new, we need a new polling place. What do you got for me? I need two hours or something like that. <laughs> and just bring up my list and I provide it to them and then they can go and sort of uh, cold call these places basically. Yeah. And then, you know, my job takes, you know, two minutes to turn around this list and then they have to go out there, are you ADA compliant? And, you know, do you have enough parking spaces and all that, so. I love the panic in the voice that you <laughs> that was Megan, not me. Yeah, that was me. That was Megan before. Good So we also provide uh, a web application for a, for elections, so that they can uh, type in an address of a potential voter, uh, and then that address puts them right on the map. You know, it shows them that if this address is right here. It falls within Hampton too. Or if it, it comes out right here onto this building, Hampton Point. So it's a simple way of uh, entering an address and getting a, getting the correct precinct to sign something to. And uh, but what it does, it, it really empowers the election department to do this on their own, right? They don't need to call us all the time. We don't need to always check them because. They're already using our data. They're using our address points. They're using our road signs. They're using our our, uh, our precinct boundaries that we developed to be used with our address points and road signs. So they have all the information they need. They have the application to be able to query uh, the data, and they can do it themselves. So what will happen a lot of times is there'll be a new development that comes in, and here you can see. Uh, I don't know if you can see through the purple polygon transparency, but this is just a bunch of moved earth under here with the imagery. And so this is a new development going in the lower round. Uh, <coughs> so they'll have somebody call in and say, or mail in a, a, a registration form saying, I'm at uh, 3200 Haley Way in Mechanicsburg. Well, it's a very new development. You guys might not know where it is. It's probably not in your shore system. So what they'll do is they'll come over here and they'll they'll figure out where this is by just typing in 3200 Haley Way. It'll pop right here. And then uh, what Megan does in the elections office, she'll go in there and actually click on this road segment, this Haley Way road segment, and she'll see, okay, this is the address range for this. This is the, ad the address range is from 3200 to 3212. And then she'll click on this, and this, this, these are other Haley Ways, so she'll have to click on this segment too. But then she'll, she can develop her own high-low road range for Haley Way that she can, in, she can input that into the shore system. And now anybody who calls in registering for Haley Way, that's already in the shore system because uh, Megan went in there and figured out what the road ranges were from our road center lines. So this, this uh, Voter Locator web application um, has really been uh, a big asset for us in order to serve elections, but also to make it extremely efficient for us to do so. Because we're at no point do we tell elections you need to put Haley Way into your system. They're figuring out for themselves based on the work that we're already doing. 
Uh, so NISGIC is the National States <coughs> Geographic Information Council. Uh, in the last couple of years, they've uh, really been trying to tout uh, benefits of geo-enabled elections, which we've been doing for a long time, 12 years. Uh, so their recommendations, there, there's been a, a pilot study, Pennsylvania, and uh, they're identifying uh, for, for the goals of Pennsylvania to eventually establish a work group, uh, promote stronger relations between elections and GIS, uh, get all the voting precinct information in all 67 counties, uh, get some governance on best practices and standards for GIS and elections. This, this is very important. Getting, getting governance and standards is um, really what Pima has been doing with Next Gen Island 1 in GIS. And Pima has done more for the GIS, statewide GIS community in the last two years than the previous 20 years, just because they're working on governance, they're working on data standards. And they have money, helps, um, to incentivize people to move towards those standards. Uh, so here's a summary of, of kind of what we've been doing in our in our county. Um, for for the precincts, we're involved in that whole life cycle of drafting and acting and publishing those all the way through the, the redistricting process. I think we've been involved with four municipalities so far with redistricting. East Penn, Upper Island, Silver Spring, and South Middletown. Um, we do uh, quite a bit of analysis on how, how, how do we create those precincts. I think uh, when we started East Pennsboro was the first one we did back in 2007, mm -hmm. like that, 2008? 2007. 2007, we redistricted East Pennsboro into 10 precincts. Developing those drafts, those draft precinct boundaries, took us about three months. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just did not know what we were doing. And uh, the latest one we did was Silver Spring, it took us three days to come up with like four different proposals. Um, because we figured out a really good process for automating a lot of that workflow. Uh, we have a list of potential polling places. Um, we try, we try to aim and check um, and synchronize those registered voter listings with what our GIS database shows. And we have that voter locator web application so that elections can continuously check um, our GIS data. Uh, so I, I try to put this into a, a a visual workflow model. So here on each side, um, in the red, we have sort of a, uh, a state mandate, um, a state mandate that, probably, that really isn't in a geospatial format. So we have the election code and the shore system. And in the blue, we have our, really our base mapping GIS elements, right? So boundaries, roads, address points, those are really base map <coughs> GIS data elements. And in the blue here, or I'm sorry, in the yellow, in the yellow we have a, a GIS function, a GIS tool, a process that we use to um, get a data output here in green. So we're cutting up this poly boundaries based on the election code and roads. Uh, we're cutting those up, we're getting increasing polygons. We're taking roads and address points and we're using the shore database to geocode those addresses and get voter points. And now once we have increasing polygons and those voter points, we get you in the elections because what we're doing is we're verifying where those voters are and where those precinct polygons are. And we're making sure that those voters are in the right precincts. And we're, that's really the essence of that geo elections. Okay. Uh, so I have an opportunity slide, I have a, a challenge slide. These are really just my opinions, so. Um, Take that for what you will. But uh, as far as opportunities, I see that most counties have capable GIS departments. And uh, the State Department is beginning to organize a statewide elections GIS project. Now, um, they, they started to organize that last year. I still really haven't heard much about it. But they know, it's, they, know they need to do something. Um, we have accurate address databases being developed for support of 911 by the counties. We're leveraging those really excellent 911 data sets, our roads and our access points for use in elections. Uh, 
and Pima's working really well with them. Pima's uh, been a great leader in GIS throughout the state, and uh, really developing those elections layers with these good 911 layers can lead to really good uh, tools for addressing those voters, getting those voters uh, into the correct spots. Some challenges that I see, uh, jurisdiction there are jurisdiction boundary issues. There's issues with our municipality boundaries. There are some counties have problems with their county boundaries. We're a little bit luckier because our county boundaries are a river and two mountain ranges. So we don't have as many county boundary issues as other counties do. But those boundary issues trickle down to precinct and legislative boundary issues. Uh, authoritative data, such as the, those court order precinct descriptions and the shore voters, the shore voter records, are not stored in spatial uh, formats. Uh, so it takes, a, it, it takes some time to transform those data sets into GIS before you can actually do anything with them in GIS. And then you have to keep doing that. I mean, the, sh the shore database, um, you know, the best solution we have is just taking, getting an export of every single registered voter and then geocoding that. And then next time we have to, we want to synchronize, we get another countywide export. And we have to geocode every single registered voter again and check it. So that leads to some inefficiencies of always having to geocode the whole data set every time instead of just checking you know, the new stuff. Maybe. And there is no law or official recommendation for GIS in elections. Uh, Act 17 of 2019 was the 911 re reauthorization bill. And in that bill, there was specific GIS language identifying county GIS to be the source of address points and road sign lines for the next gen 911 system. I mean, it, it clearly laid out in that bill that GIS was required, county GIS was required for statewide 911 purposes. Um, so that was a long way. And having the money to back that up, back that mandate up helps, of course. But you know, having that GIS uh, language in a, in a bill really helps to push the ball forward in, in getting uh, GIS as a, as a real uh, solution uh, for uh, elections or not one. So that's my presentation. Justin, one of the comments you have under opportunities is that the PA State Department is beginning to organize these statewide elections GIS project. Yes. How, if <coughs> at all, would that impact what you're doing here? So, how would that affect our local municipalities? So, I believe that the State Department is looking into um, setting up a work group that will have, uh, that will we'll look into doing a pilot project. Um, so, so far, all I've seen is some potential members of the work group. And I don't even think they've had their first meeting yet. Uh, but hopefully that will start similar to how the 911 Pima project started. Um, because essentially it's a state department that needs to get into the GIS game through locally sourced county data. And uh, I, I've, you know, I've, I've talked to this, uh, Mike Moser at the State Department about, you know, there's some good lessons to be learned from how Pima and uh, GIS has, has developed in the last couple of years. So hopefully they're not starting from complete scratch, but hopefully it'll, it'll look like an on-one model where they're getting input and data from uh, the county folks, but they're developing a statewide solution. So that, um, and that statewide solution in 911 looks like uh, a spatially enabled geo database that can help route calls to PSAPs. Um, so hopefully, you know, taking that transition over to elections, that can look something like uh, counties submitting uh, precinct polygons and then leveraging 911 road center lines and address points to create some side of, to, to create a geospatial element within the shore system, a geospatial some kind of GIS function inside the shore system to help them to help elections folks have more confidence in placing their registered voters. Because right now, all um, when, when they get a registered voter to place, 
they're placing them within this, right? And this doesn't give you as much confidence in where you're putting somebody as being able to look on a map and saying, oh, okay, that's, that's where it is. So just, uh, just being able to put a GIS system within shore, I think that would be the ultimate, uh, the ultimate function. There's an RFP out for a new shore system. Um, so I know one of the requirements in there is for it to be GIS enabled or G I don't know what the term is, but to be able to do that. And then the state came and met with us and Mark um, to, to see what we do with GIS and elections. And they were very impressed with what we did or what, Jeff, or what Justin does. Um, because many counties don't have this and are not as thorough and aren't able you know, to, to put people in prison. So I'm hoping Justin will be part of that work group whenever they get around to it. I think they're too busy with Act 77 and voting machines and everything right now. But yeah, I understand yeah. why they're busy. <laughs> yeah, so, but I mean, that's, they came to look at what we do as kind of like, at least it seemed to me, as like a base model of what they're looking for. Another question in regard to the, the precinct district and redistrict. The um, you know we're well into this growth phase for Cumberland County. We've just driven a number of these, and that that trend is not over. So we still got a bunch of those plans. So the question I have for you is: You mentioned the first one of these we done was I guess East Penn it took three months. Three months to to get these uh, on the period. These, these proposals, these draft proposals. Okay. And then you said the latest one, which was where was down to Silver Springs. Silver Springs, essentially three days. Is that a good benchmark that that's what a, the reason I'm asking is I know when I go and speak anywhere in the Hampton, <coughs> they're already talking about they want they want redistricting. You got some other areas that are adding a lot of housing. Yep. There's a good chance we're going to be going through this exercise yep. a few times. But so, so and I was just curious how big an undertaking that is for us to well, run the hypothetical. Well, so, well, right, yeah. So, I mean, how big of an undertaking is it for the GIS side? Yeah. It's. I mean, we already have the stuff in place to do it now. Sure, there's a lot of political will that needs to be created to, to, yeah, yeah. to get that off the off the ground. But on on, on the GIS technical side, uh, we're at a point where we have the system, we have the workflow in place, uh, and we have the data set. Built, um, we can create something for him. I mean, the more, the more, the more registered voters, the longer it takes. So what you can do is you just take however many registered voters are in Hampton, divide that by twelve hundred. What? Twenty-two precincts. <laughs> yeah, That's, that might take a while. Um, that I would, I would say you should probably at least give us a week for that. But, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, that's. That's just how you. That's how you would roughly figure out how it would be. And I would say 22 plus one or two, just to give us some leeway, because you're not going to be able to fit exactly 1,200 each of these. I mean, because you have to have some leeway for following physical boundaries and being contiguous. And, and you look at potential growth as well. Yeah. So you so, look at oh well, okay, maybe there's only 1,200 right now, but there are six different developments going that, on. That's in this why area. Uh, this precinct in Silver Spring is the smallest because this has the most potential for development in the future. So I would say that you know maybe um, this precinct or this precinct is probably still about this size, but this one is probably up by at least 100 at this point, probably because we we try to envision it for future development. What are the four that we've done? Uh, Silver Spring, East Pennsboro, South Middleton, and Upper Allen. Uh, so Upper Allen was how long ago was Upper Allen? It was right after East Pennsboro. I think it was East Penn, Upper Allen, South Middleton, Silver Spring. So 2007, 2008. Or 2007, 2009, and I think 2010. But we are on hold. We cannot do anything until 2022 per Act 77 because of the census okay. and everything. So we can't touch anything for a while. We have to wait for the census block lines, which then Justin has to do his thing, which then, it, so it's, we at least, I think it's 2022 is what Act 77 says. We are on hold. Well, I'd be surprised if we hear this all the way from here. I mean, well, every time they ask, I tell them 22, and everybody pants and runs away. So I'm not sure. <laughs> because it is a lot, and there really is no way to, other way to do that. And every municipality, and I can convince you, remember when we did Silver Spring, it's like, well, we don't want nothing. 
Well, that's what it is. Well, There's guess nothing. What, guess what? How many they would need now based on population okay. there? They would need 15. Yeah. That's six of the they have. Yeah, so. And, and Hampton's going to run into the same problem as Silver Spring did, where you're going to have precincts with only the, only residential housing. Yeah. yeah. But all that could change because of the mailing process now. So the oh, the mailing. mailing. Oh, yeah. So the number of people coming to the polls is going to be reduced. So that might not be a problem anymore. She goes point. How's the impact How do we? I mean, I understand what you're saying. Few people, <coughs> we never know how many they're going to be. Right, we'll never know that in fact. We'll never be able to. So we still have to plan for the. We would. This if everybody was coming out. Yeah, because there was nothing that I've seen in Act 77 or the follow up of Act 94 that addresses that particular right. circumstance because of it's the unknown. Just right. because you apply for a mail on this year doesn't mean you will next year, doesn't mean you couldn't mm -hmm. follow you. So, yeah, unfortunately. Oh, it, no solution. So. No, so what will happen is everybody in Hampton who doesn't want to wait in line is just going to do a mail right? Yeah. And that'll be, yeah. So essentially, that's their solution to overcrowding. Not efficiently, but right. that's the way it's going right. to de facto work down. Probably. Yeah, that's very helpful. Upper Allen is, I mean, looking at all this new townhouse story, Upper Allen right. and Lower Allen, and just wondering if they're going to turn around and do Upper Allen again. So it would be the, the same. Issue here with the mail to probably yeah, take so. some of that pressure off. And, and usually it's the township or borough that will request that from us and then we yeah. move forward. And it's it's three days for, or a week for Justin to come up with what he comes up with, but the court process and then the township, the supervisors approving it, and then the DOE approving it, and then a judge approving it. And it's it's a. So process. Yeah, I remember us going through that, but the mm -hmm. question I, I know I asked before was is that the only, it has to come forth from the municipality or is there? Um, can they petition for it? Yeah, I think uh, um, residents can petition for it, yeah. but I forget the count and all of that. I don't remember how many. And then, or we can initiate one. The board of elections that's could initiate one. That's I believe. The I had next. Yeah, I can confirm with Jen, but okay. I believe we could initiate one if we felt we needed to. Um, unfortunately, sometimes what happens is you know you only have one or two precincts that has the huge amount of voters, and the rest are small. So it's like you wish you could just take those two and divide it in half, but you can't, that's not how it works. So that's what you get to go from 11, or go from 12 to 22 or 25 precincts, which makes everybody panic a little. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thanks. Okay. Presentation nicely prepared to let you go over here. Okay, um, is there any other business that we are planning for today? Nothing needs addressed. Okay, if there's not, I'll entertain that motion to adjourn. Oh. Okay. I'll move to adjourn.